I blew his entire body apart and his limbs fly off. How do you track? How do you track anything? No, <laughs> it's like... The animation looks ridiculous. That was easy. The hard part here is the transformation. I'm curious to know how you think this one was done, because I watched it and I think I figured it out, but I want to hear you guys. Thanks to Noom for sponsoring this video. Stick around to see how you can get your free Noom evaluation. Hey, what's up everybody? We're back, I'm back. It's VFX Artist React. We got Joe Farrell sitting on the couch. He's a VFX supervisor, right? And he's a very good VFX supervisor because he's done a lot of movies that you know and love. Transformers, Wolf of Wall Street, iRobot. You made a robot cry. So we're going to be asking Joe about all the crazy stuff he's worked on. Hopefully he'll reveal some cool secrets about how he got some of these crazy shots and some fun stories from, yeah. I guess, your decades of being in the industry. Yeah, I got some fun ones. Some that I can say and some that I can't. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> all right, let's jump in. Let's just jump on in. So you were nominated for an Oscar for your work in Hereafter? That's correct. As nominees most often say, it's just great to be nominated. But we did work with one of my idols, director Clint Eastwood, and Hereafter was done at a different company, Scanline. We got the job mainly because Scanline has this amazing software called Flowline where we can do water simulation, and a water simulation back then was possible, but hard work. That's not good. That's a big water sim. The first 10 minutes of the movie is recreating the 2004 horrible tsunami that wiped into Indonesia and all the islands down there and killed a horrible number of people. This shot is crazy. Yeah, this is, this is, this is ridiculous. <laughs> These are incredible achievements in terms of visual effects, especially for 10 years ago. Not to mention, like, how do you track? How do you track anything? <laughs> <That was my laughs> it's question. Like, for match moving or camera tracking, there needs to be defined points of geometry in space, and then those points get tracked to conclude where the camera is when it is taking that frame. But if you have no defined concrete points in your scene, in other words, if your scene is water and in a clear sky, there are zero tracking points with which you can use that geometry to rebuild your scenes. So how the heck do you track a camera? Yeah, Clint, in this particular instance, grabbed a camera, jumped into the ocean, and he just sort of filmed it with him on his shoulders uh, wow. with the camera out of frame, and he's with the actress just wading in and trying to act through the performance with the waves and the advantage is, is because you can't track anything, you also have no point of reference that you need to track it. So in, what really needs to happen is you just need to make the camera do what you want it to do, and then it's just hand rotoing the waves and the water and the splashes. So you guys can kind of get away with not really having to worry about matching the motion too much when putting her into the crazy swirling river. You need to check the general gist. Now the human body is a very forgiving as far as perspective is concerned. You can get away with sort of breaking the rules of what the camera can do up to like 10 to 15 percent probably. It's always about manipulating the image to the quickest best photographic method to try and get there in the end. I'm just blown away at how good this looks and, and also the fact that you're rotoing water. <laughs> The tricky part was making real water blend through to CG water. So that's when compositing comes in, but you need access to the CG asset to be able to modify it without breaking the characteristics of water. Water has reflection, refraction, transparency, and different kinds of gradients. For instance, at one point, two rivers combine, and one of them's dirty and one of them's clean, and the simulation needed to happen between them to blend. So a lot of work was done with pulling the water apart and putting it back together again in the comp so that we could blend all of that. But what we're also needing to do is we're needing to tell a story. So there's a shot here where we start on them and they're spinning while the camera moves with them. So in reality, it's just the two of them going, ah, 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 like that. But the camera needed to go from here to here. Well, there's no reason that the camera and them aren't in a whirlpool spinning. Mm. Sure. So we prevised all of this and designed it, and then simulations. So trees are simming, all the debris is simming in the surface, but we're also simming deeper into the surface so that we can figure out how the debris moves and floats and moves around it. The guy reaching out to her, that's just a dude on a green box. Oh, really? So the interesting thing is that the hard surfaces were rendered separately from the ocean, so we needed those two pieces to sell each other. So. When you say hard surfaces, you mean like all the actual objects, like yeah, so the wood and the cars The, the wood, tree. the simulations, the cars slamming into buildings. But the disadvantage of a broken out thing is they're unaware of each other. And so trying to sell all that together is where the compositing team comes together and really sells all this stuff with water caustics and lighting and shadows and gradients and pulling this stuff apart to put it all back together. 
Why couldn't you just render it all out as one thing back then? Mainly because of the fact that we're integrating the live action. You're trying to also work with getting photorealism in there. And some things that come out of the render aren't photoreal as well. If you try and put all of those calculations into machines that we were running back then on the racks 11, 12 years ago, you wouldn't have had those renders out of the farm. So in order to render that, well, let's shave a few of these things off, render that out, render this out, pull it into the comp, and then the comp artist goes and puts it back in. That's something the digital domain did on iRobot. My father tried to teach me human emotions. They are difficult. Weta and Digital Domain approached the transparent market of the robot very differently. Weta rendered it out with their hardcore Lord of the Rings render farm, where they would run ray-traced caustics breaking up through this plastic mesh. Digital Domain built this in very, very complicated, intricate gizmo in Nuke, where all the renders would render it out into pieces and they would be combined in a comp script. The beauty of that was that we were able to tweak it left, right, and center without ever going back into the render farm. The hell, I don't want my toaster or my vacuum cleaner appearing emotional. I did not murder him! So Sunny in that, for instance, we needed to read the nose, we needed to see the curl of the lip, and if they rendered that straight up as a ray trace, all of that stuff would have pushed through it, and we would have done iteration after iteration after iteration. I see, so you're always essentially rendering in parts in case you need to go in and tweak. So by having the kind of like silicone outer shell as like a separate pass, so to speak, really let you work with your transparency and the light on it to really pull out the facial features as needed on a shot by shot, exactly. artistically interpretive basis. Yeah. You have to do what someone asks you, don't you, Detective Spooner? But in this one, he, he goes from angry to crying. The animation on this is beautiful. He's got a quivering, you can see his eyebrow clenching up there and his lips quiver. Mm -hmm. And then at the end, I actually was putting little tears, these little wells of clear oil. Some mineral oil yeah, in his eyeballs. Yeah, some mineral oil or something there that he starts to get a, a little teary, you know, robot tears. I thought you maybe like just insulted his like CPU, so he like, his hurts were too low, so he's dumb. He's like, <laughs> maybe if only we could get a real robot to emote like. That. Well, it's great because you keep it subtle. You know, you're not doing tears running down the robot's no, cheeks. You know? No, no, no. Was there a take like that? Was no, there no, no, okay. no. It's pretty subtle. We subtle. We, we push the boundaries in in movie making. It's all great. The time. It's great. The mummy. Something about the mummy. The, the mummy keeps showing up in all of our VFX yeah. Artist React episodes. Dude, the mummy is great. <laughs> I think we all like working on them because it's just so slapstick and hilarious. And we had fun here. Like we burnt sheets of plastic cheese to make Jet Li explode. Now you can rule in hell. Look at, that. Look at those cheeks. I know. Yeah. <laughs> little flames. Little flames start shooting out of his cheeks. <laughs> and then, boom. I blew his entire body apart and his limbs fly off. Wait, so you got the cheesy cheeks going, and did you, is that the actual footage of cheeks, or did you just reference? So I found a really good technique for doing it, which is basically you get a mesh of a face, but what you can do is you can unwrap the UVs from the face. You've now got this weird distorted UV face, and then what you do is you then just simply put down your cheese, and then you 2D track it, and then you just rewrap your cheese burning with that oh. new track back onto the mesh and stick it back on, and Bob's your uncle, tracking instantly. That's a great technique. I never, that, that's amazing. I've also heard that this is a lot of what is done for a lot of de-aging and digital makeup these days at places like Lola and a lot of other studios. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Dude, the lava through the eyes, that is brutal. That's yeah. one way to go. For Hand sure. tracking all the fire onto the various armor. We just set fire to some bits and pieces and then I had to track all the hands. Yeah, the fire on the body looks Yeah, the fire really on the good. hands looks really good. Doing real fire is hard work and you guys often bring it up and I'm, I, I always giggle when I see it, but it's really difficult to shoot fire practically to do what you want in the shot. But if you simulate the fire, the sim has got shape. A lot of the times you can take the real fire and do some shaping to it. So you sort of shape real fire, shape real sim, combine the two in comp, and you won't end up with that sort of problem where you're trying to fight the photography, and you won't end up with the fire being different levels and the fire not looking right. That's a solid technique. Dang. Well, Sam, your bed buddy Alice. Whoa, 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 whoa. There's a shot here in Transformers, which is one of the gnarliest shots I've ever worked on. This was like the like four seconds for four years kind of situation. I took nine <laughs> months to do a shot that's four seconds long. <laughs> a lot of detail in this shot. Yes. The animation looks ridiculous. That was easy. The hard part here is the transformation. You can see all these tiles on all these maps. So we take projections, put them onto the tiles. Those tiles then need to lock her performance. And you can see they pull from her form to the robot's form. You're essentially having 
to blend between her footage and she's mapped onto a 3D version of her that's flipping in. Mm -hmm. And then you have the robot kind of flipping out and you have to blend those two together. Yeah, but it doesn't all happen as one piece. So it progresses from her hands down, her inside chest happens, and then her face does it all individually. Because these are just renders. Like I just get a render of all the tiles of her doing their thing. And then I get a render of all the tiles going from the inside pieces turning down to the robot. And then the robot gets from the robot pieces back into its piece. Then there's shadows, then there's reflections, then there's all this sorts of stuff that goes into it. So this shot was by far one of the most complicated shots I've worked on. Goodness, like in my mind, when I'm doing any sort of shot like this, and it's the most basic Andrew Kramer video co-pilot version <laughs> of this, even that is daunting to think about. And like, this is the most advanced version of that. You're blowing my mind here. You blow my mind like three or four times just with the sheer amount of work that you're putting into this. And Luckily, they don't tell us that it's going to be nine months when we first get awarded the shot. Okay, They're like, yeah, Joe, yeah. we want you to do this cool transformation of this girl transforming into a robot. I'm like, oh, that sounds cool. And then nine months later, I'm like, <gasps> 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 <laughs> <laughs> If it's any consolation, this is one of the effect shots that I distinctly remember from the movie. Oh, good. It was, okay. it was that good. Oh, this one. I'm curious to know how you think this one was done, because I watched it and I think I figured it out, but I want to hear you guys. All right. I love a good puzzle. It's not often I watch a shot and I'm like, <gasps> I don't know how they did it. Wow. Oh, we're not done yet. <laughs> watched it and it took me 20 times before I think I got like 85% of it figured out. All right, here's Nico's uh, wild shot in the dark. <laughs> Opening with the helicopter shot slash CG. It's the building with the smoke coming out of it. I think there's a seam between that neighborhood that we're looking at there and the city that's in front of it. It's two separate passes basically. But as we keep going here, we're in a drone shot now. And then somewhere around here is a transition to a crane shot maybe? Or if you see a very slight wobble, it could just be a classic, bring the drone down and catch it. And now somebody's walking with a gimbal. So there might be a handoff from a crane to a steady cam operator, or there is one of the cleverest blends I've ever seen. Why isn't this possible to do practically for real? Uh, because you'd put actors at risk. If that's a drone, a drone, flying, yeah. you cannot fly a drone anywhere near performers. They're shooting with Aries, probably. If you're shooting the Ari, you need a very heavy duty drone. And that drone is one, very loud, yeah. two, very heavy. And boy, I've seen those things lose control. Oh yeah. And so, you know, those things are, are tricky and they do beautiful things. But if it's a lightweight drone, you wouldn't get an image this nice. No, you wouldn't. You could throw a GoPro or maybe even like Black Magic or something like that on there, but it wouldn't look like a Airy. What's stopping them from lowering a steady cam operator down, holding and filming? I could see a possibility of attaching a Ronin to a drone. The drone comes down and you magnetically pull the Ronin off a drone and then you become a steady cam as you move back and the drone just gets out of there. Actually, eliminate the drone. I think you had it figured out though, potentially. You hook up like a Ronin onto a cable. The cable's dropping it. Oh, it's it. a cable car. You can control yes, those remotely. Yes, yes. So the guy's just sitting on the screen watching it. You know, maybe it's wobbling and stuff like that, but the Ronin's going to keep it stable yeah, to some yeah, degree. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a cable cam with a magnetic switch goes over to a Ronin and a steady cam. Bam! Figured it out. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> now I can sleep. Now we could have this completely wrong, so <laughs> hey, if you worked on the shot, shoot us an email or something. We'd love to figure it out. <laughs> That'd be great. <laughs> Hats off. Well done. That was really nicely done. What's one of your favorite VFX shots from something that you didn't do? didn't do. The work in gravity had me just from one side to the other side just going, oh my goodness. <laughs> I've just give them the Oscar because it was <laughs> just stunning work. There's a trailer for Star Trek, the new J.J. Abrams one, and I think it's probably one of the best trailers I've ever seen in my life. Oh, it wow. is from the beginning to the end. Locking torpedoes. Emergency evasive. Fire everything! Like I'm not a Star Trek fan, but I watch the trailer and I'm just like, man, that just makes me want to make movies and do cool <laughs> stuff. So, you know, it's a, it's a passion that comes from just constantly being in awe by new things that come out. June. And that's a friend of mine, Paul Lambert, who's the supervisor. He's got so many Oscars now, it's ridiculous. He's swimming in Oscars. Yeah, he's swimming in <laughs> it's Oscars. It's like Scrooge McDuck, except it's a bunch of like little yeah, Oscar spikes. Yeah. And Paul is one of the hardest working people. So he and I were similar positions at Digital Domain and he went on to great things because he's just an absolute rock star. Yeah, that director is my favorite in terms of style and tone. That like dark style, dark tone is the best. The opening shot to Blade 
Blade Runner, the original film, oh. by far my most favorite shot of all time. And the reason being is I got to meet the model maker who did all Ooh. the etchels. He worked at Digital Domain, Les Ecker, and he was one of the guys that put all the little fiber optics oh into goodness. all those brass etched pieces. Just old school techniques like this, I just love. What's up everybody? I'm back to talk about that little sensitive subject, weight loss. And with today's sponsor, Noom, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about my journey. I actually started my whole weight loss journey in March of last year. I started my journey at 254 and just this morning I weighed out at 229. But it took me a really long time and a lot of hard work to get past that 230 number and uh, Noom really helped me get there. So I'm going to tell you about a lot of the cool tools and stuff that they have uh, that helped me get over those humps. So Noom is a science-based psychology type app. It's not a dieting app, but it is a science-based app that helps you make small changes in your daily life to have a better relationship with food and exercise and overall health. Noom is not about the quick program or the recent fad. I've done some of the fad diets. They're not sustainable, you know, you can, it, I'm never gonna swear off cookies forever. And Noom doesn't ask me to do that. Noom is all about the small daily decisions that promote sustainable long-term change. No joke, I literally use Noom every day. I'm able to track my food through their food tracking and color system. Green, yellow, red. You know, red foods you're supposed to really limit. Yellow, you can kind of eat in moderation and green, go ham. So it's a total like psych trick that they've taught me that just be like, oh man, am I, do I really want to eat this if I have to log it and it's going to be red? You know, like, do I really want to lose that, that progress that I've made? Noom also pairs with your favorite health tracking app. I have a ring here. It tracks my activity so then it actually gives me an accurate calorie budget every day that I'm supposed to kind of hit or stay with it. Shout out to Jennifer, my personal coach. She's actually like a one-on-one -on -one line I can go to uh, whenever I have kind of questions and stuff. She's never trying to tell me this is exactly how things are going and this is how Noom says you have to do things because that's not what Noom does. Noom's trying to help me change my mindset and my relationship with food and exercise. And they also have group classes. I know this is a nerve-wracking subject to tackle, but if you're ready to take charge and make some sustainable lifestyle changes in your overall diet and health, check out Noom. I have lost 25 pounds since I started this whole journey and Noom has been a huge help. So if you're interested, go to the link description down below and you can take your free Noom evaluation and get your own customized program set up just for you. Let's start making some real change. Let's do this together. And you guys can hit me up at any time. I'd love to see updates and progress. Uh, you will continue to see them from here from me. So uh, I hope everybody enjoys it. And until then, let's get back to the episode. So we often ask for what are your favorite shots from films, TV shows, classic films. I would love to know what are some of your favorite VFX from YouTube videos and other online creators. I'd love to do a breakdown of some of the stuff that we've seen on YouTube from some of the wonderful digital artists here. Joe, thank you immensely for joining us yes, on this show. Yes, it was my pleasure. Anytime you guys want to invite me onto this therapeutic couch, I'm here. Don't forget to also check out Clint's channel at youtube.com slash Yeah, I'm you know, teaching people how to do VFX in my weird way, so come on over, We're hanging out, it's a good time. All right, Joe, thank you so much. To all thank of you, you watching, thank you so much. We'll see you either this Sunday, tomorrow, because we have another video usually on Sundays, or next Saturday if you don't watch our other videos for some reason. <laughs> see you around. <laughs> see you around.